Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and I'm here with Lucy Gray. We're the co-chairs of the Global Education Conference. This is the 2017 Global Education Conference, the eighth year of this fun event. This is our second keynote on the first day. We have a terrific panel here, and we have a lot to cover. So we're going to move quickly. Special thanks to our sponsors and supporters. Uh, huge recognition to participate. Uh, they've been a, a tremendous supporter over the last few years, and we are really grateful for it. New this year to us, Cutter Foundation. Digital Promises here again, taking a global special fiscal agent relationship with them, uh, and we're very appreciative of that. Center for Latin American Studies, Aludo, Blackboard Collaborate. Anyway, thanks to them, and we appreciate the support. Okay, those of you in the audience, we're going to quickly let you indicate where you're participating from. The, the, key, the panel will want to know. So to the left of the map, click on the star icon, then click on the map. Put a note in the chat as well. Maybe give us the time, the temperature, any other information you'd like us to know about where you are. New Zealand, Australia, Middle East, Eastern Europe, South America, United States and Canada. Wherever you're participating from, we're sure glad to have you here. And now I'm going to skip forward from the map, but please keep putting notes in the chat or put a note in the chat as to where you're participating from. Okay, this session we're calling Where in the World is Global Education? And what a lovely play on words here, right? This is our international panel of global education leaders. We're going to start with 90 second introductions. So, Molly, 90 seconds, who you are what to do, how you define global education, and what is the current state of global education where you are? Hi, I'm Molly Bickley, and I'm a collaboration specialist with uh, Taking It Global, and really happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. And um, I define global education as really any opportunity for students and teachers or anybody to, collect, uh, to connect outside their classroom walls and learn with others. Um, which provide unique learning experiences. And really, to me, it opens up classroom walls and learners' minds. Um, and I'm finding in Canada and the communities um, in which I'm working, this is becoming um, something that is almost expected, and it's, it's really growing. And it's exciting to see that it's growing, even though that a lot of us have been in this game for about 15 years. So thank you. Oh, it's me. My name's Gavin Dykes. <laughs> I'm based in London, uh, and I, my main role is as Program Director of the Education World World Forum, which is a meeting of ministers that happens each year in London. Uh, and I set the agenda for that, and it's, the ministers come from right across the world. Now, my belief in global education is that it is defined by the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that people, and students, teachers, need to live and work successfully in the world today and to make it both a successful world and a peaceful one. What's the state of global education, do you think? In, in where? Well, where do you world? live? So you're obviously, you, you <laughs> live in the policy world? Yes. So I, I, I would say it's, uh, in fact, that young people are very keen to know more about the world whether they're getting enough of that information through or whether their their appetite is being met is a, a bigger question. Nice. And we do owe the, the lovely title of this session, Where in the World is Global Education, to you. Okay, Lucy. So in my context, um, I'm you know, where I started was with educational technology. I went to Europe in 2006 with Apple um, as part of an Apple Distinguished Educator uh, trip and we um, and I was moved about the technology role um, in global education because it didn't seem like that many schools were automatically connecting and collaborating online at the time, even though we had some tools that were available to us. And um, so that's where I, my context and where I come from, the world that I live in. And by the way, one of our keynotes tonight also was on that trip, Lori Rowe, and it inspired her to do some other work as well. 
Um, so when I think about global education, I'm thinking about globally connected teaching and learning. And what I see in the ed tech world is a lot of um, efficiency with using technology, but not a lot of deep learning. And globally connected teaching and learning leads to deep learning, I think. So that's the problem that we have a lot of teachers who are becoming more adept with doing things, but in a very functional way and not in a particularly deep way. I also see here in the United States that, and this is why I convened this panel, is that um, it's not a huge priority in comparison to other things in school districts. And I'm one, really wondering why or how we can move forward in at least this country with our efforts um, to, to make global citizenship a priority, you know, fostering global citizenship. So that's where I'm coming from. Julie? Hi, everyone. Julie Lindsay here. Um, I've been working with global collaboration for 20 years, ever since the internet hit education. I'm currently working more at the higher education level, but I also uh, run my own um, organisation where we design and implement online global collaborative projects for K to 12 levels, and that's through Flat Connections. So I think I define global education as this, you know, developing a curiosity about the world and instilling in our our learners, our, particularly our young learners, K to 12, that curiosity and wanting to know about the world, wanting to connect with the world, and then giving them, of course, the bridge to be able to do that. And then I usually say, you know, learn about the world with the world. So this is going beyond the textbook. Um, now, the current state of global ed, well, I don't know, sometimes, some days I despair, I really do. Look, I'm not working in the K-12 school in Australia at the moment. I'm working, as I said, at the higher ed. I work across the world. Um, I've got quite a global perspective on what's happening. And, you know, I keep saying to people, we have the tools, we have the pedagogies, we must connect the world. And yet I'm continuing to see schools that are being stifled through lack of access, lack of um, understanding of the pedagogies, lack of all sorts of things. I just presented about it in the last hour, the, the things, that, the barriers that are stopping us. Um, I, I do believe that we need to, you know, we need to burst out of these bubbles and we're still, we're still not quite there. We still have a lot of work to do. Thanks, Steve. Awesome. Next is Anne. Hello, well, I'm Anne Michelson from uh, Oslo, Norway, and uh, I've also been working with global education and uh, getting students to connect globally for many years. As Lucy, I started uh, not with Apple but with Microsoft, and I was fortunate to go to both the Salvador, Brazil, and Cape Town, and got a lot of connections there that I wanted to share with my students. In Norway, uh, people have some money and, and they are able to travel, um, but we still see a shift from um, uh, traveling uh, and then trying to do the travel online when you're in your classroom and I think definitely that's the way to go because everyone cannot be able to participate in these different trips abroad. But, you know, I've taken students to Lesotho in, in South Africa many times and just to be able to connect with people there and then have the conversations with them afterwards is, is, is great. So I'm sure hoping as the rest of you that our country will move for, forward when they see the possibilities we have with technology to connect. Uh, so, I mean, we're getting there, but not quick enough, I think. Thanks, Tan. Anne Merchant. Hi everyone, I'm Anne Merchant and I'm from South Eastern Australia. I teach the 13 to 18 year olds in a remote rural area, but the technology has helped make the world my classroom. Um, I think that global education takes learning beyond the textbook, that it goes from classrooms to educators across the world where students can interact, learn from and with each other. And the current status where I live, I feel that I have a very progressive education department and they are just taking very small steps now to encourage classes in Victoria, you know, to go beyond their classroom and into what I would call global education. Terrific. Dana. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Mortensen. I'm the co-founder of World Savvy. Um, I've been working in the field for coming into 16 years. Um, our work is primarily um, based in uh, partnering with large urban public school districts in the U.S. Um, and working on integrating global competence into teaching, learning, and culture for those districts and schools. So professional development, student engagement, and leadership facilitation. Um, the way I think about defining global education would be um, teaching and learning that pivots around developing cultural and global competence um, and the skills needed to thrive in a more diverse and interconnected world. And I guess more to a point, education that positions and prepares young people to be agents of change around issues of consequence, whether that's in their own neighborhood or across the globe. Um, I'm actually pretty hopeful about the current state of global ed. Um, from where we sit across, um, there, we're in three cities in the U.S. and starting to do a lot more work in rural areas and kind of outstate from where we are. And I've seen the demand for this increase exponentially in the last couple of years, and it's less an issue of generating demand. Um, my concern around that is making sure that this doesn't, to Lucy's point, become kind of a checklist and something that's more shallow, um, that we can kind of check off a trip rather than looking at um, global education and global competence through the lens of deeper learning um, and something that's um, really changing the way we think about instructional practice and student experience. Um, so yeah, so I think. Terrific. George? George, are you there? Oh, turn your mic back on, George. Yep. I'm sorry, I forgot to, I muted myself so you wouldn't hear me. Hi, everybody. I'm George. I am a uh, associate professor of research in a doctoral program in global education leadership. Um, we are focused on how do we prepare education leaders to embrace global education. I also do a lot of work internationally, especially with uh, UNESCO and other organizations as, um, as an independent practitioner of global education. Um, when I think about the definition of global education, I often define it as the, the area that's concerned with teaching and learning about global issues, events, and perspectives, and how we interconnect the people of the world together around those activities. The, the things that I like to, when I talk to my students, it kind of to give that definition is to say, let's think about what it's not. We're not talking about just about intercultural. I mean, intercultural is definitely a part of global, but global is even much bigger than that. Uh, when I look at the state of global education, I'm, I'm also very positive. Um, I see even in our most rural schools, there's, a, there's an increasing acceptance that we are a much more global society. We need much more focus in global education. And there is an interest in learning about how we can equip our teachers and how we can equip our students to be better prepared for that global world they live in. Okay, terrific. Uh, so Lucy, we have now about 17 minutes to kind of dive into a conversation about this. So maybe you could kick us off and tell us, are these the answers you expected, the definitions of global education and the state of global education? Did you expect the positive answers that you received? Yeah, I think I did. Um, so I, I think we're together and more on the same page than maybe we think we are. My definition is certainly kind of superficial and a niche de definition, but I wholeheartedly agree with what everybody else has said. What I, the big revelation for me this year, um, and I meant to invite him to come participate in the panel or at least join in, is um, when you and I traveled to the, the Jean conference in Paris uh, last November. And uh, Jean is the Global Education Network of Europe, and their um, co-founder is going to be addressing us this week. So um, make sure that you join his session. And we were particularly eager to go because we wanted to, A, understand why it's been harder to connect to Europe in general around this stuff um, and, and, and develop those connections. And what we found was that there's a little bit of a different vocabulary and different issues that are affecting global education in that neck of the world. For instance, migration is a huge topic in Europe and how they're handling that and how they're addressing interactions and that sort of thing. Um, we heard terms like 
I heard the word actor a lot. <laughs> I heard the word um, global citizenship a lot. Um, Steve, what else did we hear from, from people? I have to think about it. But it was, it was a little bit of a different flavor of global education. And, um, and I think that it's, I think they're different. I think it's interesting how local drives the, the global outlook. I'm interested in, and panelists, please put a note in the moderator tab if you'd like to respond or bring up a thought. Julie, I'm interested in your take because I think of the responses. Yours was maybe the least enthusiastic about the current state. Yeah, look, Steve, I just, I'm just trying to encourage people to break out of bubbles. You know, I just can't, I've just been presenting at the Learning 2 conference, which is a conference of 99% international educators. I was just in Shanghai last week um, as a Learning 2 leader. And, you know, international schools are another sort of um, entity where you've got a lot of, a lot of different cultures. Even in American international schools, you have a lot of different cultures coming in, and they and they're very global in that respect. But in other respects, they're not because the the curriculum and the focus on learning about the world with the world is still not there. It's still um, this sort of service learning. How can we help people in the community? Um, and this this lack of not so much lack of curiosity, just this not knowing how to go beyond to really embed global learning. You know, when students reach grade, grade 8, grade 9, they should be managing their own global collaborative projects. They should be designing their own, which means they really need to start way back in primary school, elementary level, and understand the procedures, the, the design of the projects, the design of the learning, uh, so they can implement it themselves. So, you know, that's, sorry, I said a lot in one minute, but, but that's where we need to be, I think. Okay, I want to pick on Gavin for a second here, because We've known Gavin for a long time, and Gavin, it feels like education goes in cycles, and there's some new topic that comes up, and each time the topic comes up, it feels like, oh, we could use this to create really participative learning and really agency-driven learning, and then it sort of ends up getting subsumed into all of the minutia of the curricula and the like. Where is global education in that cycle? I, I, I think one of the things that affects global education in that cycle is that we constantly get it wrong. We know what we're aiming at, so we're thinking about the top of the pyramid. The top of the pyramid is of creativity and you know, grand entrepreneurship and great things like this and global competencies. But what we don't do is deal with the bottom of the pyramid, which is the critical part that stifles innovation, and that is getting the fundamentals right. The fundamentals are about attitudes and values and the, the, the behaviours of people. And those behaviours include teachers, it includes students, it includes parents. Uh, but until you get those behaviours ready and open to be taking on the, uh, the ideas that are being talked about, then actually innovation doesn't stick. So that's why innovations falter. And one of the innovations that may falter is global education because actually we haven't got the attitudes and values in the foundation level right to begin with. Anybody want to respond to that? Well, I, I could say something about global education in Norway because in our recent goals, we have a lot of global challenges. And of course, Norway being such a small country in Europe, we are eager to, <laughs> to communicate and collaborate with, with countries around the world. And, and uh, I was talking about that I was in the United States at um, Lindenhurst High School, and uh, they had some issues with the uh, certain internet pages that are closed, they can't use Google Docs to collaborate. That's kind of, that's kind of thing I, I uh, experience a lot when I try to, <laughs> to work with schools in the United States. And of course, the schools in Lesotho, we are helping them, but the internet isn't that good. So um, there are a lot of strategic and organizational obstacles in, in working with other countries as well, I think. So we've had some real sensitivity, Anne, to being people from the United States running a conference on global education because it feels hugely ironic, right? The presumption that we would somehow be the best organizers. Well, maybe we are good at the technology and the organizing, but who, where in the world is there real leadership in global education? And anyone can respond to this. Well, I, I couldn't answer that question. I, I think there's something, sorry, can I jump in? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I think there's something really interesting about this, which Anne has picked up on. I, I think Mal- Dan, Dana said something about it too. It, it, one is about rolling up sleeves, and the other thing is about actually the, the context that we're working in. One of the fantastic things about Europe is that it is made up of small countries very close to each other. Small countries with different languages, with different cultures, with different ways of behaviour. And by, by having that so close together, the whole sense of where global education is something I think tends to be quite different from when you're in uh, a very large country which has uh, many different things going on inside it itself. So therefore looking beyond the boundaries is sometimes more difficult. So the, I, for me, that makes Europe a very good place to be looking for where global education is happening because actually Norway in your connections with the rest of Scandinavia, with the rest of Europe and then much more broadly are much more fluid uh, I I think and much more open than tends to be the case in countries which have uh, if you like greater inertia. Ann Merchant wanted to jump in. Can we go to Ann? And was that you, Dana, who wanted to go next? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Ann, and I'll, I'll go after. Oh, okay. I just wanted to say, I think we are the leaders of global education. People are within this room, the participants, those who are moderating, etc. Um, and it's up to us to keep sharing and pushing out the amazing outcomes that it can lead to. We can share simple things that can, can be done with that global education just before it becomes embedded because I think once people start with little steps they see that magic and it automatically becomes embedded in their curriculum. Thanks Anne. Dana? Yeah, I was just going to make two comments. Um, I, I sort of absolutely agree with Gavin. I think one of the things that's interesting in the U.S. now to me is that um, it, we have this semantic kind of issue or, or um, argument going on and like why don't more people want global education and I just wanted to share when I was in East Tennessee and I went in to chat with um, our, who eventually became partners to work there and chatted about this global competence work for about two hours, you know, they, they slapped their hand on top of the matrix that defines the values, attitudes, behaviors and skills for global competence and said, yeah, we don't want to call it that. Let's just call this relevant learning and workforce development. So I think it's this lesson to me, and I think it's something the field has really struggled with, at least in the U.S., around what do you call it, how do you frame it, um, are you a purist about it, is it malleable as long as the right kinds of competencies are being taught, um, can it be integrated and flexible for whatever other struggle a district has or a school has. Um, that was the one piece, and the other is that I think we um, – the, the cross-border collaboration is so critical, but what a lot of schools that we work with in the U.S. are struggling with is that um, as live in Minnesota, um, we take in a lot of refugees. And so in St. Paul Public Schools, there's 126 languages spoken. Um, but in many ways, um, right here, um, Somali, Hmong, um, Hispanics, all, all, you know, students across a spectrum of ethnic and cultural diversity and not a huge, robust foundation for inclusion. So I think... They're hyper aware of the need for this, but it's not necessarily being called by the names we call it. Um, and it's something we've almost kind of had to study as a separate discipline in understanding how to make this palatable. Um, because I think people do believe they need it, but they're not identifying with the same language. Molly, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I wanted to sort of piggyback on what Anne was saying about um, all of us in the panel have had the opportunity and good fortune to be able to embed these programs into our classroom, but then also be sharing those experiences with others and and really trying to get people excited. But where, where um, sort of we found um, the disconnect was people would leave our the presentations and be really excited and then not know what it looks like in the classroom. So now we have such great tools that as a professional learning community, we are able to actually mentor some of these people who do reach out to us and, ha- and share with them what does it look like, how can we make this happen and keep it sustainable in the classroom and um, almost like a balanced digital literacy kind of a model it, that we show them what it looks like and then we're with them for the first project. And it's a li- you need to be a little bit creative, but you know, we, even in 
being global educators we are, that sort of creative thinking. So how can we be supporting those teachers that we get excited um, to be continuing those projects um, in their classroom, and I really think it's by building that, a really strong PLN. And I know at the very beginning of this journey, Ju uh, Julie Lindsay was really um, helpful to me, and um, you know, mentoring us as we went along this journey as well. So I, I think it's really important that we sort of step up our game as well. Great, Anne. You wanted to contribute again. Yeah, I, I agree with Anne Merchant that, you know, we should model something that's easy for every teacher to do so they can get started. And, and, and when I talk in Norway, I usually say, you know, it's not that you don't have to know everyone around the world. You just need, like, a teacher in the United States, someone in Australia, or someone in South Africa. That's what I have. I have amazing educators that really help me all the time. And like Anne in, in Australia had this great uh, lesson plan about uh, fake news. I took it. I invited the United States. We had a great project. And you know, just by using blogs, uh, the, the, the students discuss things, and then they can Skype afterwards, and then they can discuss and get comments on their blogs. And I mean, it's, it's such an easy thing to do. So as you were saying, Molly, you know, having the personal learning network and helping teachers getting that and just having a few relationships Around, around the world that they can work with us, that's enough. And I think if we can just help teachers to get to know that, then we're, we've reached a far long way. This has been so interesting. We've got just a couple minutes. I want to ask a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, deep pedagogical uh, areas, like global education, uh, obviously have multiple levels, but one, of course, would be entry into first use and, and people practicing it. And then one would be sort of long-term sustaining of that um, concept as a part of the teaching tradition. Is there an example of another concept or idea that has done well in this regard? Is project-based learning maybe something that we could be looking at and saying, okay, project-based learning is pretty well accepted, is it a model for how you take an important topic and bring it into the curriculum? Can I jump in there with just a, a, a line on this and just see how it works? <laughs> I mean, so there's a lot of talk about curriculum. I always feel that we should judge curriculum by the amount of space that it leaves rather than by what's in it because what we tend to do is stuff full curriculum and you get that inability to actually go beyond the boundaries of it. So leaving space for things to happen. And, uh, the, the specific thing I wanted to mention was I organized a thing called the Maverick Teachers Global Summit that took place in India, in, in, in village India, about three hours outside, the, um, outside Bangalore, and it took place last year. We, we brought teachers from across the world together to, uh, and we tried to work out what they could do. So what we got them working on was seven of the sustainable development goals in groups of about five each. Uh, uh, four American teachers amongst them uh, and then people from all across the world. Uh, and when they worked on this, they worked on taking their sustainable development goal, they worked on uh, what, were the what were the challenges of teaching it, what were the opportunities and could they build a prototype of what was done. At each stage, what they presented they then presented the, the, the outcomes of their discussions to children, children from the villages of India, who critiqued their work. That was the job of the children, to critique and changing the curriculum around and getting people to do it. Now that, getting international teachers working together in that way, getting the children to critique their work, created layers of innovation which are still work, being worked on today. So for example, Tommy in Vermont, if he was listening, is is running um, running yoga lessons with somebody in the Himalayas, one of the teachers from India who works in the Himalaya, uh, and they're doing video conference yoga lessons as a result of that. There are international projects going cutting across people because of the connections that were made, and and that's where Anne's points about making connections, building relationships, building personal learning networks, and getting people working together is the way that we build this out. I'm trying okay, to keep by, by luck of the draw, Gavin, you get to do the first big oh. ideas of resources. So again, 90 seconds here, 60 seconds, 60 seconds plus. Oh, right. Let's go through these quickly <laughs> and then we'll have a conversation on them. 
Okay, I was just trying to think about how to pull this together in a particular way. So, and my first thought is so often we take responsibilities away from people and then we expect them to behave responsibly. Well, they don't. If you take responsibilities, they, they behave less responsibly. And this is true of teachers, it's true of students, it's true of, uh, it's actually true of ministers. Uh, a good place to start taking on responsibilities with setting development goals. So I would really, really go for them. 17 goals there, they're all laid out. There's all kinds of work. There's great uh, information to draw down from the world's largest lesson and other sources like that. And if you take on these goals, this means taking responsibility, research and action, and taking the best of all the potential, but, uh, all, all the potential amongst children to make a local difference that can become regional, national, and international, make an impact. So if we could work around that, I think we can do something which is um, really makes a difference and will engage people in the international work. Okay, so other panelists, if you want to comment on that. Make a mental note because we'll come back and let you respond. Lucy, your big ideas. You caught me while I was multitasking, trying to help a presenter. <laughs> no, I'll go on. <laughs> come back. I'm ready. I can go. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, so I noticed that real change happens, at least here in the U.S., when teachers, there's buy-in from teachers and they get excited about it and they carry it, the movement on without the benefit of, um, of administrators. So for example, um, the Ed Camp movement is like that. Can somebody turn off their mic, please? There's somebody typing in the background. Um, and then, so that's what I mean by grassroots. I think it really needs to come, it needs to be a bottom-up rather than a top-down movement. I think that there needs to be more opportunities like we're providing here in a very cobbled together way for people to, to leverage technology to connect. I mean, what the, it seems like a, it's still 10 years later to me seems very basic. Why would you not use technology to connect yourself? I know there's bandwidth issues in places, but we're still not really leveraging the technology to, to do some rudimentary connecting. And then, um, and then another idea that Steve and I have been exploring a little bit, and um, we'll be covering it at a COSIN event this year, is the role of digital citizenship in global citizenship, or vice versa. I think it, I think it goes part and parcel, and that might be another entry point for for instilling global global ideas and that sort of thing. Terrific. And again, make mental notes, Dana. Great. Um, so the first is just to kind of harp on what I brought up earlier, this idea of making this very local. Um, connecting across borders is really key, but for <laughs> in a lot of the places we're working, people are so, a lot of the cities we're, here in the U.S. are quite segregated. Most people uh, are creatures of habit and stay in their neighborhood. Um, we've got, you know, we've got young people who, you know, are in Baby Hunters Point in San Francisco that have never seen the Pacific Ocean, um, you know, who are in high school. You just thinking about the way that people get trapped neighborhood to neighborhood. And so a lot of what we've done is use case studies um, and examinations and kind of community mapping to get people to understand where the global shows up right where they are. Um, the second is just our experience with in the last five years working, trying to work, um, so much of the burden has been on teachers. Um, so much of the burden has been on teachers. And so we're really trying to look at sort of systemic change that has this kind of um, thinking, taking root at a deeper level, um, what does it look like to engage multiple stakeholders in that, including um, leadership um, at a school, and to think not just about the classroom learning, but also what's happening um, in terms of the culture of the school, uh, in terms of inclusion. And then the, the third is, you know, um, really working together as a community that's focused on um, supporting global education to get out of this um, sort of the narrative around soft skills. Um, there's great research now, um, great research um, that suggests that these kinds of competencies are as important or more important than some of the more traditionally valued high-stakes test academic skill sets um, for um, helping young people thrive beyond school. And I think the more we as a community can work on sharing really high quality ways to assess that um, and to resist the temptation to make that a high stakes, high stakes testing um, imperative, I think the, the, the movement will do better um, because the research is starting to pile up in, in favor of that. 
certainly. Terrific. Okay, George. I wanted to provide some some feedback that I was able to get from a study of UNESCO ambassadors, a study of uh, leaders of UNESCO affiliated schools, and a study from the actual people who work inside the education division of UNESCO itself. So we were uh, we were asking what are the what are the things that we need to do to equip leaders of schools to empower global education on their campuses and what we need to do to empower global education leaders themselves. So this was, uh, this was a study that was done looking at 208 different cultures that participated in this, 208 different countries that are a part of UNESCO. Um, compiled 761 individual competencies down to a total of 70. When we look at those 70 competencies, this is what those individuals said. Uh, they said that global education leadership is not necessarily about the specific global knowledge in the Sustainable Development Goals, those kinds of things, as much as it's also about instilling a global awareness and worldview. So we need to we need to think about how are we how are we helping people become more globally aware in those schools? How are we helping those schools and those children in those schools have a have a broader worldview than what they might see just within their communities? The second piece of that was within leaders especially the interpersonal competencies that leaders have in global education, such as uh, their ability to cope with stress, their open-mindedness, are just as important as that global worldview. So they need to have the right, they need to have the right interpersonal um, ability to lead that global education initiative. The other one that uh, that came up was this this connection to 21st century skills, and I heard this in your in your thing, Lucy, that. Um, the, the, the idea of disconnecting 21st century skills with global skills isn't, uh, isn't really there. The creative thinking, problem solving, adaptability, the use of technology, those all things should be interwoven with the idea of global connectedness because that's where global connectedness is, is most evident. And then finally, if you're thinking about uh, what a good leader in a school is who empowers global education, uh, the, the reality is that, that a great global leader is a great leader itself. So be a very capable leader in your school and make global education an agenda. Terrific. We're going to have a lot to talk about. Okay, Molly. Thanks, Steve. So um, sort of my um, big idea is about global education. It, really, just like Julie said and others have said, is it allows opportunities for students to learn with the world instead of just about it. And definitely there are lots of resources through organizations like IRON and, and all of the work that are being done around the sustainable development goals and really allowing the students to learn with others, whether it is in their own community or within their own country. For example, some of the work that Taking It Global is doing now with indigenous communities in the north, these kids uh, don't have a lot of, uh, they live in fly-in communities, they don't have access to internet, and uh, Taking It Global has provided opportunities just to have them connect with experts and other students around the world, and it's really life-changing. Um, or having students in India co uh, collaborate with students in Canada and looking at uh, the a carbon footprint project and how uh, similarities and differences in carbon footprint and and how we can solve those really big issues just by um, not you're not going to be solving it with the students but starting the conversation about these big issues with students and then having them physically come together if possible and looking at those issues together. Um, I believe that global education really supports a wider network of professional learning. I said that um, just in, um, a few minutes ago, and opportunities for teachers to connect through organizations uh, like Taking It Global Education, and there are, are lots of organizations that will connect um, educators in, in looking at some of these, uh, these issues and just the ability to connect their students. And um, one of the resources that I want to share is something that um, sort of shocked a little, shocked me a little bit and surprised me happily was is a new Ontario government initiative that looks at 21st century learning, and they actually list global citizenship as one of um, one of the six pillars of 21st century competencies and what students need to have, and and they're looking at stu all students. Um, 
should be contributing to the society of culture and local and global and digital communities in responsible ways and engaging in local and, and global initiatives and uh, interacting, interacting safely online using technology and creating a positive digital footprint. So um, that resource I've, I've listed there, and it's really something that a lot of us have believed in for so many years, but really great to see coming out of a ministry level from the government. I was pleasantly surprised um, to see that come out last year and actually quite proud that um, our government has done that. Thanks, Molly. Okay, moving on to Julie. Yes, hi, Steve. Um, okay, so, you know, we've, a few of us have talked about, you know, students being able to learn about the world with the world, but, you know, what I say is um, also we need to look at curriculum-based opportunities and however you want to phrase that, it means getting the, getting the good stuff into the normal school day. For many years, I used to do global collaboration as an after-school club or an extra or a lunchtime gathering. It just doesn't work. So, you know, if you want to, if you really believe that building global citizenship, um, global competencies uh, is important, we need to look at it very much from a curriculum point of view. And every student at every grade level, from K right through to 12, should have global experiences, global collaborative learning experiences every year. And what I'm seeing and where I start to despair, sorry Steve, is that um, you know you might have a, a grade four teacher who's leading the way and a bit, bit of an outlier and they're implementing a curriculum global project. They move to grade five, there's nothing. They move to grade six, there's nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So they get one experience in the whole 13 years of, of K to 12 education. So this just isn't good enough. So you know we do need to develop better leadership from the, the glass from the grassroots as well as you know above. Um, so and global collaboration must be designed and planned. And I'm focusing particularly on that global collaborative learning experience that goes for not just the the Skype call, but the you know we're going to work together for four weeks, six weeks, ten weeks, twelve weeks, or even flatten the learning for the whole year. And this does include. Um, student leadership. Thanks, Barbara, for all of your comments about encouraging, you know, student leadership along with teacher leadership. So, you know, and I do have that book that I published through ISTE there, just as a resource, the Global Educator, and uh, you can have a look at my the work that I do through Flat Connections. But, but it's you know, it's in, it's imperative. We have such a lot of work to do, educators. But you know, this this conversation is so important. It's so great to see so many people in the room to share this with us. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Okay, Anne Merchant. Um, I agree with so many of the previous uh, presenters. I also think that learning goes beyond the textbook and the media. We see the world through our media in Australia. We see it one side is through a textbook that someone's read, uh, written. Sorry, But if we actually collaborate and interact with other classrooms and communities, we can see so many similarities that we may have despite the differences that we may perceive. Um, and I think by developing that empathy and understanding, the students want to solve the problems of the world and here we give them an opportunity to do that collaboratively. I think it's terribly important to promote at the grassroots level and that's the teachers and the educators in the classroom. You know, help them connect, help them build global networks and sites such as Twitter. Here at the Global Education Conference, we have people from around the world attending at all hours of the day and night. I've also found that by being connected through Skype and the classroom website, that's where I start to meet the educators that don't even speak English as the first language. So again, it's overcoming those barriers, etc., to global education. And just finally, I've put a link to The World Is Our Classroom, which is a collaborative document um, that we put together at the last ISTE conference for people to take home. So there's lots of things to get involved with, ideas, links of resources, etc. And I'll if you wouldn't mind putting that link in the chat. Link in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> <I'll just laughs> Sorry, okay. I forgot it's not active. <laughs> uh, Anne Michelson. Okay, and I'm on now? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I agree with uh, Julie. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, there's a huge difference from just having a Skype conversation or chatting on a blog than having a real commitment and having kind of a whole whole year commitment of co collaborating because that's 
that's really what you need to do. And, and if you, you need school leaders who could put that on the on the curriculum if they're um, able to, you know, that we can we can and we can have be sure that every student in every class has the opportunity to do this, and not only just with one special teacher, but with everyone. So I totally agree with that. Um, we need to be familiar and accessible for everyone everywhere. It, it, we, we need to have um, access to the tools that we need. We need the teachers to know what to do. We need to teach them you know, how to use uh, the different tools to connect. We need to give them the places to meet. Uh, we have to make sure that they know how to implement this. And uh, I have some um, uh, links to my web page there where I discuss these different topics here. And at the end, I also have the blended learning, brainy learning theory, because I'm thinking that everything has to be interconnected. You can't come into a classroom and then, OK, let's take off the computers. Now we're going to collaborate and talk with other people, other places. I mean, it has to be integrated in everything you do in your classroom. And uh, you have to show each teacher and each school leader that using technology this way is going to help your t uh, students in their learning by connecting with other uh, schools around, by having conversations about difficult topics, the sustainable goals. We work with that uh, with the students in, uh, in the United States and New York now. To realize that we all have the same problem, we should be working with it and trying to come up with solutions. And that we really basically have to change everything that's going on in our classroom. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm talking in at a conference in Norway in a couple of weeks. I'm addressing my school leaders and I'm calling it innovate or die. <laughs> because if you don't change what's going on in the classroom, I think students are going to go somewhere else for their learning. Uh, so we need to bring the, the school and classroom has to be a place where you can meet people and come up with these great ideas that you can't do alone in your room with a computer, that you need to come to school and that the teachers give you something that you cannot find on your own. And what the teachers give you is, are the connections and the know-how and the help on how to do this. So I think it's so important that school leaders train the teachers, have workshops, share ideas, show the good examples, and basically just work with this a lot. Okay, so that's my talk. Nice, thank you. Okay, we're gonna, we've got, what do we have, 13 minutes left. We'll have to give a little, people a little bit of a break to move on. So let's say we're gonna take 10 minutes. Did anybody wanna respond to another panelist's comments? While we're waiting, Anne, I wanna ask you a question. Could you easily describe the difference between the education system in Norway and the education system in the US in terms of vision? of the ultimate goals, and if so, how does that relate to the ability to adopt kind of high-level thinking things like global education? Well, I think it's interesting when we went to the high school, we, uh, which, is, which is a great high school, great people, great teachers working there, but you know, in our school we have something called block scheduling, and it's like the whole day we have just one subject, and we can really do the project-based learning. I, I can, you know, we can do whole projects, make videos, make podcasts, because I have my class from 8.30 until 1. And I think the mindset of our students is a lot more mature just the way the curriculum is, because it's not, you know, multiple choice tests, it's, it's more it's more deep learning. I think we're getting there in Norway. And actually now we've they accepted that we can use the internet during ex our certain exams, which I think is great as well. So um, I, I think in Norway we have the opportunity of really, really moving forward. So I, it just depends on the school leaders and the teachers seeing uh, the possibilities that are there and, and knowing about it. Because uh, And we're working on the curriculum goals as well now to make them wider, I think, so more to work on. So I'm, I'm optimistic about Norway. <laughs> Again, panelists, feel free to put a note in the moderator tab if you'd like to speak up. Uh, I'm interested in both Anne Merton and Julie Lindsay. Although you're in Australia, the Australian education system is often seems to be compared to the United States, the system in the US a lot. Do you see a similar difference, though, in terms of a vision of what schools are about and how that then relates to the ability to adopt kind of higher level thinking? 
until I, I hope you don't mind me jumping in because my school day is about to begin. But unfortunately, I think that our curriculum is set by very much by people who are not always educators, etc. So they don't tend to have the vision, they don't have the understanding of what perhaps can be done. But I think because we have this more grassroots um, networking, etc., that teachers themselves can actually put the curriculum into global education, etc. Um, so I'm just really sorry, I need to go and thank you for having me and all the best with the conference. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate all of your comments and your help here. Gavin. Yeah, I, I, I was just, I, I wanted to question whether uh, building this into the education system is the best way to do it. And the thing is building um, it, global citizenship. Uh, there's many different ways to do that. If, if, it, if it becomes a subject, I think we'll kill it. If it becomes, uh, and that's kind of a classic way of building it. If it's about putting it in the curriculum, you'll get into arguments about, well, what is it we're going to stop doing? Uh, and so all these kinds of things uh, come into play. And I think actually building it as a force that is integrated across the whole curriculum by getting people who are concerned about uh, global issues and play it into every single subject. Uh, and you do that because the subjects are there already. We're not having to actually create new issues. Uh, is, is probably a, a, a better way. But my other prejudice on this is that in having worked with the innovation unit in different countries uh, and looked at uh, how you try to affect change, what so often happens with the innovation is that the innovative part of it is destroyed as it gets drawn into the mothership of education where you have particular ways of curriculum, particular ways of assessing students, particular relationships between students and teachers uh, that have to be maintained. And it squeezes out the innovation that can be in the way that you address those new subjects. And actually, what I think we should be doing is taking education out of that mothership and putting it into a more innovative space altogether. <laughs> George wanted to George wanted to respond, and then Anne, did you? Someone else wanted to say something, but let's go with George, and then we probably have time for one or two more. Well, I wanted to I wanted to explore that idea about the the purpose of education, and I think every I think that every culture, and I think that every school is having to wrestle with that a bit, and I think that's because of the the influx of information technology that we have now. So we the purposes of school used to be to make sure that we instilled the content knowledge that every student needed to do, have to be a functional adult. So you know, we, we would try to turn them into human Wikipedias where they had this base foundation of knowledge from which they could work with. I think what has changed in the information age that we live in now is that we have such ready access to information, we have to understand the context of where that's coming from. And so we have to ask the questions of how does that apply uh, just as much as, as is this authentic. So that, that ability to put it in context is what I think drives the importance of global education. How do we understand that this piece of information that we found as fact, how does that play out? How do different cultures see that? How does that play out in different, different places across the world? And that's the fundamental challenge that I see that's, that's, that's happening at local levels and at, at state and national levels is this, this interplay about um, what, what is it that we still need students to know, what is that content, but then what is the context that needs to surround that so they understand how to apply it and apply it in a global world. So I know someone tried to respond earlier and I wasn't sure who it was. Was it you, Dana? And I think I see Dana talking, but I'm not hearing her yet. Well, I'll uh, I'll jump in, Steve, and, and say one of the one of the challenges that I think that many schools are running into with global education is a bit of disconnect between what the school and the school leadership may see the need to be, and what uh, the community may need to see. And in, I know that in some in some areas that are highly diverse, 
there's there's a community push to, to ask for more global integration within the schools. On the flip side of that, sometimes in our more rural communities, um, there feels like there's there's a pullback. Um, what what are what, wait, wait, what are we why are we trying to get these students connected into other ideas or other cultures that that I don't quite understand myself? And so that that conflict um, that many teachers may feel in global education, um, or that schools may feel with trying to implement global education, oftentimes gets wrapped up in the community. I'm very interested in how my colleagues have maybe dealt with that. I, I'm interested too, and I wish we had two hours. But our next set of sessions are in five minutes. So I, I know Dana wanted to say something, and Dana, you're somehow muted. Maybe your headset is on mute, or there's something else, because your microphone was turned on. Let's see if we can get you back. We're not hearing you, although we could, see could I just moving. say something? Steve, can you hear me? Of course, Dan. Yeah, could I just say something? Because that's something that I experienced uh, when working with teachers in the United States and Australia, that, you know, they're much more reluctant. I think uh, the community might be more reluctant and, and afraid of, of talking on, online. And I've had to, you know, speak with the students before I could let them speak with my students in Australia. I remember I had to get up early to Skype with them just so they could see it was the teacher who was moderating. And in Norway, the, the parents in high school will not interfere with what we do. So we, we have, you know, a lot more leverage on, on going into projects like this because we will not have you know, parent involvement or being skeptical to things we do. So we're lucky that way. I just want to say that. Okay, I'm sure there's that there's there's some, Sorry. Go ahead, Gavin. There's a, there's a, in, 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 speaking from uh, from Norway, on the, there is a there is a whole um, a whole another hour we could spend on actually how the culture of openness has developed. Uh, yes. I, I think yes. across the sure. northern European region, frankly, and therefore filtering isn't really a big question. I think uh, those kinds of things with, with when the internet came in, it was open, and therefore the openness of conversations, the openness uh, of um, ideas, openness to ideas, is a, a fantastic asset. Yeah. I'm going to stop us now, not because there's lots more good to say, but we need to let people move on to the next session. Lucy, did you want to say anything before we finish up here? I thought I would uh, read uh, Dana's words because she, she her, her audio went away. She said her comment was twofold. One, that we're moving from a system um, that standardized learning to one that prepares young people for a rapidly changing world and in video data, it's a big shift. And second, she wanted to flag the overlay of race as part of the discussions in the U.S. I sense in Europe race is not uh, discussed as, as part of this global ed movement, which is interesting. So that's a whole other conversation, you know, the role of, of that. I want to say that I think I, I would, I'm not so sure about that, but I would be really curious to hear at some point from Ann um, what she thinks about that, but that will have to be next year, I guess. <laughs> thank you, Ann. Thank you, Ann Merchant. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, George. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Gavin. And thank you, who's our last panelist there? Julie Lindsay. And we, we sure appreciate everybody. We're going to turn off the recording now that you get to the next set of sessions. Awesome work. Thanks so much. Bye. Good job. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Let's keep the conversations going. I think we need to have more of these of, of why things aren't moving or how we can move it forward. So if you're going to be presenting at a conference, anyone in this room, you know, this might be a topic that you want to tackle in, in your corner of the world and, and start asking why. Why isn't it working or is it working? Um, I think it's important that we all kind of collectively raise the level of awareness of this. So thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care now. Bye, Julie.